Welcome to It Pays to Fear God. Today is a special day because we're discussing a very important subject, captioned the harp of God. The harp is a musical instrument, and in the scriptures it had ten strings. When played by a good musician, it produced a soothing, melodious tune. To some it would inspire them, to some it would calm them. Jubal was the first person to really be playing the harp like that, if we read Genesis chapter 4 verse 21. And the story of David is really where the harp came into play, because King Saul had some madness issues, and when David would play the harp, he would be relieved of those issues. And this was described in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, which reads, And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. That is the power of the physical harp. However, this sermon is not just going to be a discussion of the physical harp. I mean, it's nice, but what's better is the Word of God, the spiritual harp of God, which will be the discussion of this video. But before I really get into that, I have a question that you can answer in the comment section below. It isn't related to this subject, but it does engage healthy spiritual discussion to get our minds kind of thinking. And that question is, what is the tree of life? It was mentioned in Revelation, Genesis, and so on, so what really is it? So you can answer it in the comment section below. And also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can be notified when we make future subjects just like this. Anyway, let's get back to that subject, the heart of God. It's important we understand that just as how the physical harp makes melodious tunes, soothing tunes, when the Word of God is discussed by someone anointed to do so, which is the class of the apostles, then it creates that same soothing, as in like, we are inspired by it to those, of course, who are God's children, the children of the promise. If read Romans chapter 9, verse 8. And those people who are qualified to discuss the message like that were talked about in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 2 and 3. They sang the song that no person could learn except them. It doesn't mean that they were physically singing. It was that they were discussing a kind of gospel that came from God himself. If read First John chapter 2 verse 27. And if we look at different places in the Psalms, we can see that the harp was in some way connected with God's statutes and stuff like that. Not just the harp, of course, but generally the idea of music, the idea of songs. David said in Psalm chapter 144 verse 9, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. Of course, we can't forget Psalm chapter 49, verse 4, where David said, I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. And in Psalm chapter 119, verse 54, it was also said that God's statutes, his laws, his commandments were like songs to him. And he said, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. But then the question is, well, what is really the harp of God? I mean, it's not a physical thing, and sure, it's the word of God, but, I mean, isn't there more to it? Well, of course there's more to it. Just as how the physical harp had ten strings, the spiritual harp of God can be divided into ten fundamental truths. Now, before I list them, there are a few things you need to know about them. One, they are of equal importance, all of them. They all talk about God's purpose, God's plan for mankind. If you remove one of them out, then the plan will not flow and it will not be possible. Two, they all have a connection with each other. Even though technically they're chronological, as in, for example, the Abrahamic promise happened before the birth of Jesus Christ, all of them kind of have a linking with each other because they're all geared towards the same plan. They all forward God's purpose. And, you know, spiritual things don't connect the way physical things do, so they're not necessarily geared to time. So you can see that they all kind of have a linking together. These are things you need to understand in case you might be a little confused with how the discussion of those 10 fundamental truths are going. And anyway, let's start off with the list. So the first string is creation. 
The second string is God's justice manifested. The third string is the Abrahamic promise. The fourth string is the birth of Jesus Christ. The fifth is the ransom sacrifice. The sixth is resurrection. The seventh is mystery revealed. The eighth is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The ninth is the glorification of the church. And the tenth is the restoration or restitution of all things. And in this video, we are going to play on that harp by exploring what those ten strings really mean and how they tell the story of mankind and God's purpose for our salvation. So let's go into those ten strings. Let's start off with the first one, which is creation. Creation was like the first step to what God wanted to do. In Genesis chapter 1, he created the earth and so on. But what's most important to that entire process was the creation of human beings, specifically when God made it a living soul. He said in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is when man actually became life. It actually started living, and that was when Isaiah chapter 43 verse 21 about us worshiping God began to fulfill. Then the second string is God's justice manifested. Essentially, God told Adam in Genesis chapter 2 from verses 15 to 17 that you can eat anything that you see here pretty much except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now keep in mind, this was not forever. It was, in a sense, a test. And if Adam were to have passed it, then he would have had access to the tree of life, spoken about in Genesis chapter 3, from verses 20 to 22. And you can see that that would have opened him to eternal life. But because he failed by eating the apple with Eve in Genesis chapter 3, from verses 1 to 6, God had to pronounce the death sentence upon him, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, which reads, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, so thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That was God's justice manifested upon them, and it affected the rest of humanity. That was what St. Paul said in Romans chapter 5, from verses 12 to 19, that it was from one man that sin entered into the world, and death by sin, but of course he then made that connection between how Jesus Christ, who was also one person, brought eternal life for all of humanity. See also 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for a better understanding of how that concept works. Then the third string is the Abrahamic promise. Essentially, the Abrahamic promise is found in different places. You can read it in Genesis chapter 12 from verses 1 to 3. Chapter 15 and verses 5 and 6 and from verses 10 to 14, chapter 18 as well. But we're going to look at Genesis chapter 22 from verses 16 to 18, mainly because God also swore on the promise. And there he said, But myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. God was not necessarily talking about the physical kind of people who would be coming, like, okay, the millions of Jews all fulfilled that purpose. Really, he was talking about Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is really the blessing of humanity, both in the fact that he paid the ransom and he's helping to rework us back to God as future strings that I'll be discussing later will help us to understand. So he was talking about how Jesus Christ would come from Abraham's lineage. And that was why St. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16, when he was talking about the Abrahamic promise, that Jesus Christ is in fact that seed that God was talking about. So it was through Abraham's lineage that Jesus Christ would come in, and that is what the Abrahamic promise has to do with God's purpose or plan for salvation for mankind. Then, the fourth string is the birth of Jesus Christ, and I just linked it with the formal one, the Abrahamic promise. The birth of Jesus Christ is a very significant event towards the salvation because that was the beginning of what would sort of start 
that process of us coming back to God. When he came into this world, angels said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward man. And this birth was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 5 and 6, where Isaiah the prophet said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That is what the birth of Jesus Christ has to do with these ten fundamental truths. Then, the fifth string is the ransom sacrifice. This is really what makes Jesus Christ popular in this world, number one, and that is what began his preeminence in all things. In Colossians chapter 1, from verses 18 to 20. And the Bible prophesied that he would pay the ransom, and that would eventually lead to him becoming king, which would bring humanity back to God. And we find this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, where Isaiah the prophet said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong the days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And of course, Jesus Christ himself made the disciples to know that I am the ransom for humanity. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, where he said, Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Then, the sixth string is resurrection. And I'm not necessarily talking about all kinds of resurrection. I'm talking about specifically the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because St. Paul made us know in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verses 17 to 20, that if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. And he even said in verse 19 that, if that idea of Christ being resurrected was not true, we are of all men most miserable. But then in verse 20 he said, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. It was because Jesus Christ resurrected that the saints could also partake in that same resurrection. In fulfillment of John chapter 14, from verses 1 to 3, when Jesus Christ called them up to begin ruling and judging the world. If we read Luke chapter 22, from verses 20 to 30, and it's through that as well well, that humans in this world will be resurrected when the time comes. If we read John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29, where Jesus Christ said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, into which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Then the seventh string is mystery revealed. For a long time, humans didn't really understand what God was doing. They were just living day to day, you know, year to year, but they weren't really understanding the entire plan for mankind, how we would be restored to perfection. There was little bits of here and there, but when Jesus Christ came to this world, he revealed that to mankind. And in Revelation chapter 5, it was illustrated as a scroll being opened by someone worthy and qualified. And that person who was worthy and qualified was Jesus Christ himself. And St. Paul spoke about this in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8, quoting David the psalmist in Psalm chapter 68 verse 18, where he said, Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What are those gifts? They're the revealed mysteries, a new understanding of God's plan for us, for salvation purposes. And St. Paul, of course, who was an apostle who, along with the others, the mysteries were revealed to later, as in Jesus Christ revealed the mysteries unto them and all that, had something very relevant to say in Romans chapter 16 and verses 25 and 26, where he said, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations, for the obedience of faith. So that is how mystery revealed is a part of the salvation process. We needed to understand 
what exactly was going on, and Jesus Christ revealed such mysteries to the world. Then the eighth string is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The disciples, after listening to Jesus Christ, explain a lot of things, talk about the kingdom of God. They wanted to know when it was going to happen because they knew that this was very important and if they were to miss it, bad things would happen. So they wanted to be sure that when it would come, they would be aware of what was going on. So they asked them, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of the coming and of the end of the world? Jesus Christ knew that this was an inspired question because of its importance, and he began to list signs that would help them know his arrival, starting with the fact that nation would fight against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and that obviously represents what happened in World Wars I and II. Those were unprecedented conflicts that the world has moved on from. That idea of the kings being defeated, like that entire idea of autocracy now being left behind, that couldn't have been imagined any time throughout human history until the last century. And that is very significant, which is why it, I, it makes us to understand that Jesus Christ has indeed come. Obviously, there are a lot more signs to this, but I've made a video, The Signs of Christ's Kingdom, which you can watch to give you a better understanding of why we say Jesus Christ has come and the kingdom of God has been established. It's a very big claim, so you should obviously know why we're making it. Then the ninth string is the glorification of the church. This is an exciting one because it actually tells us as humans that God is not only helping us, but we are eventually going to be glorified. For a long time, righteousness and those who exercised it were persecuted. Satan the devil, who was the god of this world, if we read 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4, is a wicked person. He is not a righteous man. So when people want to worship God, when people want to do God's will, which is contrary to his own, because he wants to be independent from God, if we read Isaiah chapter 14 from verses 12 to 15, those people are persecuted. Nations that want to be righteous, they are also persecuted by neighboring nations. And if you read the story of Israel, you can see this. But in our time, God wants to end that. And how is he exactly doing that? He's changing the way the world works so that it's not people who are wicked, people who murder, people who kill, people who oppress that are going to be honored. No, it's people who are righteous, people who obey God. Ones who are charitable towards mankind, not just in physical money, but in the power of their example. Those are going to be the people who are honored. And Isaiah the prophet had a lot to say about this. He said in Isaiah chapter 52 and verses 1 and 2, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And of course, there are many, many other places in Isaiah. Isaiah chapters 51 to 66, which you can read if you want to understand more about how the glorification of the church works. Specifically, Isaiah chapter 60. Because that particular chapter is all about that. Then, the tenth string is the restoration of all things. This is kind of like the climax and the conclusion of the whole matter. And this is also happening in our time. The whole world so far has gone through, just like I just discussed, a system where wickedness has prevailed. And he wants to restore that because... Really, it makes us lower. When we are oppressing one another, when we're envying one another, when we're hating one another, we're thinking that that's, that's good, we're elevating ourselves, when in reality, we're actually bringing our value down. And because God is our Heavenly Father, He understands everything that we're doing like a father knows his children inside out. Therefore, He is trying to rework us so that we can be like gold, even then the golden wedge of offer, if we desire. Chapter 13, verse 12. And how is He exactly doing that? 
Well, there were kings and there were princes that oppressed humanity. And guess what? Are they still doing so? No, because they were defeated. Free Revelation chapter 6 from verses 15 to 17 that was prophesied. And there are now charitable organizations which are focused on helping humanity. Sure, there's a lot of, you know, hypocrisy. And I mean, still, those who are rich are still the most honored. But... Eventually, that's going to change, and we can see that already. The Nobel Peace Prize doesn't go to the richest people. No, it goes to those who are actually interested in humanity's well-being. And that is going to continue until humanity is glorious, both to ourselves and to God Almighty and to heaven. And, of course, this was summarized by St. Peter in Acts chapter 3, from verses 19 to 21, where he said, Repent ye, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, whom before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. That, my friends, is the ten fundamental truths which constitute the heart of God. When apostles preach this kind of message, preach the harp of God, when they play upon that harp, the children of God all over the world to hear that message, they are called to it. It is like music to them. And when they hear it, they know that this is God's calling. And it is only those who have righteous minds, good minds towards righteousness, who are in a part of that category. And Jesus Christ, who described himself as the good shepherd in John chapter 10, said that he knows his sheep and they know him and they hear his voice in John chapter 10, verse 27. And of course, God knows his children if we read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. So he's dispensing the message so that that can be like a call that will grab them gather them to his fold and fulfillment of Genesis chapter 49 verse 10. And to conclude, we should understand that the reason why the harp of God, God's gospel and message is being preached to mankind is to reconcile us to himself. And St. Paul said something very important to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verses 18 to 20, which of course I will use to conclude. And there he said, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And my friends, that is where I'm going to conclude this subject, the heart of God. Let's hear a tune that some of us might enjoy. Like I said at the beginning of this video, this is a very important subject, and the whole Bible has talked about it. So there are a lot of details that obviously couldn't be covered in this video, but I have something good for you. We've made videos that have covered every part of the subject, and all of them are linked in the description below. So you should check them out if you want to know details about these 10 fundamental truths, because they are fundamental to our understanding of God's purpose and to our worship, eventually. 
Have a great day and God bless you.